Hi guys. Sorry, I'm a little later than I planned. About 15 minutes. I was having uh, some. I wanted to print out the motion, and I was having some printer issues. So, sorry, I'm a little bit late. A little bit later than I planned. But people are jumping in. Hi. I hope wherever you are that you have better weather than we do. <laughs> while I'm waiting for people. Hi, Jason. Um, yeah, we had another three to, or four to five inches of snow yesterday, and starting next week, we're going to hit the deep freeze where it's supposed to reach minus 20, and that's not with, that's not wind chill, that's ambient temp, so I envy everybody that's in warm weather right now. So yeah, so I've been hibernating. Hi, guys. Um, and I feel like I'm never going to leave the house again <laughs> if it doesn't stop snowing or isn't so cold. Stop being so cold. Uh, I'm uh, just waiting for a few more people to come in. Take a drink. My mouth is dry, as always. Okay, well, I'm going to get started. Obviously, you can always go back and watch if you miss the beginning. So, oh, okay. So Kathleen today filed in the Court of Appeals a motion to stay and remand, just like she did before. This time, she is asking for the remand on claims regarding the state handing over the bones to the Halbach family, um, and she cites the, the appropriate statute. And um, she specifically cites uh, Youngblood versus Arizona as uh, the case law that she's referring to. <laughs> I think that most of what you need to know is really in the motion itself. I can't expand on it too much. I didn't actually get to read as much of case, the case law as I wanted to. I briefly skimmed the three major cases she talks about just so that I knew exactly what was said in them. Um, the first thing, I mean, she cited, cited three cases primarily. Obviously, Youngblood versus Arizona, um, State versus Trombetto, and uh, Greenwald, State versus Greenwald, and that was the Wisconsin case. The first two are federal ca cases, um, and then the Greenwald is a Wisconsin case. So the interesting thing about those cases is that they're all losing cases. <laughs> Um, in general, you want to try to find a controlling case that is a winning case, preferably as close to being on point as your case is. Um, obviously, that is hard to find. It doesn't always happen. It's it's really hard to find any case law that um, 43 degrees in Melbourne. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's I can guarantee it's a lot warmer than it is here, I think. Um, so yeah, you you really want to have a, a case that you know is squarely on all fours, you know, with whatever you're arguing, but that rarely ever happens. <laughs> so, um, but this is a situation where the motion is actually pretty, like yeah, like Joe said, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but yeah, they all they all lost. <laughs> but in general, like I said, you, you don't want to cite a losing case if you don't have to. But just because the instant case in front of the court was denied or the defendant lost, that doesn't mean that it's not still instructive. All of these cases are very instructive on this particular issue. There's still some gray area, as there always is. Uh, hi, guys. <laughs> okay, I just wanna make sure I'm not missing anything here. Scrolling through the comments already. Okay, so what, okay, so here's the thing. Okay, this is what Kathleen was tweeting about. Okay, when she said it was seven days until she something big was going to happen. Um, first of all, you know, obviously this is only as big as the court allows it to be. Obviously, if it gets remanded back and he's granted a hearing on this issue, um, that's good. If he wins, well then, yeah, it's huge. <laughs> but we really won't know until that happens. So you know. I'm still reserving judgment on how big it's going to end up being, but um, it, it's definitely something she had to do at this point. Obviously, you know, it's like we don't want to keep seeing the appeal get stalled, but I had said that 
if there was something that could by itself potentially get the conviction overturned, then it was something that was worth filing. If not, it was not worth stalling the appeal over. So since she's filing this as a constitutional um, due process violation, that is something that could potentially on its own um, overturn this case. Now, here's the difference between this stay and remand. Oh, here, like my t-shirt, Center for Wrongful Conviction. A supporter sent it to me, so I got a shout out to her. Um, and it's long sleeve, so she must have felt bad for me that I'm in the cold weather. Um, so, okay, the difference between this stay and remand and the other one is that the other one was asking for scientific testing that wasn't pertinent to what was part of the appeal that was in front of them. It was something that they were hoping would be helpful, but it really wasn't because it wasn't part of anything that had already happened in the trial court and it wasn't in front of them. And they're like, you can't really start a whole new process while this case is currently under appeal. This one is different because this time we are talking about a constitutional violation. Okay, this is not just like a fishing expedition to hopefully find something. I mean, this could actually be considered a violation of Steve's constitutional rights if the court determines that it is. So this remand should be granted. There's no reason why it shouldn't be because Kathleen even says, I, I believe she said in the motion, I skimmed through it really quick. So I might be making things up in my head, but I think she mentioned that um, she didn't want to um, have this issue waived if it's not brought up now, which technically it shouldn't be because the circuit court already made their decision. So anything after that shouldn't actually be waived if she wants to file a successive, successive petition. But I think she's being cautious and saying that, you know, that, you know, due to the fact that, you know, there could be a waiver issue, I really think this um, possible violation needs to be explored now. So for that reason is why they should grant the remand on this. Because again, it's specifically dealing with what the petition should be dealing with. And just because it hasn't been presented before, in this case, it wouldn't matter because this is not something, this would have to be filed in another 97406. Well, she knows that that's a problem. So she's saying like, this should be able to be added to this. And it, it is newly discovered. They didn't have this. Now, um, I know when you guys asked me last time if I knew what the big news was and somebody put somebody comment and they said about the bones and I just started smiling and everybody's like, okay, that's a giveaway. I have the worst poker face ever. Yeah, I didn't know this was coming. I just, since it took a lot longer than we thought before it to come out, um, I was wondering if maybe she changed her mind, you know, or decided to handle it a different way. I wasn't really sure. Um, but I was surprised when the first motion for stay and remand came out. I had talked to Steve right away and he had, I had mentioned that in the case of reported, it said that bones had been returned and he had no idea what I was talking about at all. And I said, no, I said, it's right there in the report. It says that. And he said that he'd never seen that before. And obviously Steve knows his case pretty well. So he talked to Kathleen and the next time I talked to him, he told me that she had never seen it before. And I just found this so unbelievable because we've had it for three years. <laughs> so I was like, how could she not have it? You know, it just didn't make sense to me. And then Carol Ann, who is the one who actually did email Kathleen, and I'm glad that she did. It ne honestly never would have occurred to me to email it to Kathleen because I thought she had all this stuff. It never dawned on me that we would have something that she wouldn't have at all. Um, so yeah, so um, Carol Ann had sent her an email saying, hey, I read this in the case of report, and is this gonna be a problem or whatever she said. She can tell you in the comments if she wants. Um, she's here <laughs> watching. So, yeah, and when Kath and so when Ka Carol Ann said that she'd contacted Kathleen and Kathleen told her she'd never heard it before, well, then I knew that what Steve had told me was right, that she hadn't heard this before. And then it becomes an entirely different issue because now it's, it's definitely newly discovered. So it's not something the court can say that she should have known before. Um, right off the top, I'm going to be all over the place, but I always am. You guys should be used to that by now. Um, she, some of, and I, I'm assuming that she didn't have it because the previous appellate attorney, Suzanne Hagopian, I don't even know if I'm saying that correct. I don't know if Sandy's here or not. She would let me know if I was saying it correct or not. But she was in the middle of the appeal. Actually, the Court of Appeals had already made a decision on Steve's um, direct appeal. And she had not yet filed, and this is in the motion, she had not file, yet filed a petition for review with the Supreme Court. 
since the appellate court had already made a decision, um, the state probably didn't feel like it needed to keep sending her updated information because, you know, she couldn't she couldn't add it at that point anyway because the case had already been concluded basically. But since there was no petition for review yet, since she hadn't even filed that yet, technically there was no legal finality to the case. And that's one of the arguments that Kathleen is making. She's saying that, you know, they, they didn't have a right to get rid of it when the appeal was still pending. You know, the case had no legal finality. So at that point, she shouldn't be, they shouldn't have been getting rid of anything yet. <clears throat> I think, Eric, I think I already answered your question with that, I think. Um, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go through these later because uh, you guys are asking a lot of questions. <laughs> so I'm going to have to scroll back later and just go through all of them. So that's one of the arguments she's making. And it's, it's a valid argument because the state can try to say that, well, nothing about these bones were, was in that appeal. So what did it matter if, the, if it hadn't reached the Supreme Court yet or if they hadn't denied review yet? Well, it still matters, you know, because I mean, at any point she could have, even after she was denied review, she could have filed another 97406 immediately after that because they gave these bones back to the hall box on September 20th, and she filed her petition for review on September 22nd, only two days later. So when it was denied, um, she could have filed another um, petition at that point if she wanted to, asking why they got rid of the evidence. So, I mean, it is important. The timing is important. It does matter. And now I have to take another drink again. Sorry, guys. My mouth's really dry today. It is all the time, but worse today. I should be drinking water. That probably help, but eh, I need caffeine. What can I say? Okay, so I'm going to probably mention that again, but I just want to get through the beginning of this. Okay, so she, Kathleen is right away trying to establish materiality. And she's saying that this evidence was material to the case because the prosecutor kept repeatedly saying that, you know, um, that the crime happened at the salvage yard, that they never left. And he kept using instances of everything that was found, including, you know, obviously the bones in the pit, um, as proof, quote unquote proof, that Teresa was killed on the property. Um, and what Kathleen is saying, and again, it's easy to understand from reading it, is that, well, then logically you can conclude that if the bones were found, if Teresa's bones were found somewhere else, if the, the bones that were located in the gravel pit belonged to Teresa, then the logical conclusion is that Steve did not kill her because why would you go and kill somebody off-site and then dump the bones in your, on your own property? It does, nobody would do that. So that's why she's saying that it logically would follow that he did not do this. So even though the testing of the bones themselves cannot um exonerate steve doesn't prove he didn't do it but within the context of what they presented at trial and the assertions they made then it definitely would have raised reasonable doubt to his guilt and again i mentioned this in my last video that's what the state has to go by they can't just change their story now and said well so what even if the bullets were found there then he could have went somewhere else well that's not what the jury heard that is not what was established by the jury in front of the jury. So you can't just change your narrative now. You know, I said they're welcome to do it later if they want to, if he gets a new trial. So she's arguing that it's material for that reason because they centraled so much of the, the prosecution's case on the fact that she didn't leave the property. Um, and then the only thing she mentioned about the defense's um, stance was exactly what I just said was that when Buting said that if the body was burned somewhere up and then moved and dumped on Mr. Avery's burn pit, then Stephen Avery is not guilty, plain and simple. And uh, and then he even said that that's why the state is avoiding even wanting to discuss that. The one thing she didn't mention, and I was a little surprised about it, is that I had said in my previous video that the the one the one thing that I thought could be really problematic for the state was the pelvic bones. Because those were actually used in the trial. Um, and I believe those are some of the bones that were given back, or given back to the hall box. Um, so 
that was, it's hard to say that that is not potentially um, important because they were already, obviously it was something the defense was trying to prove at the trial, but the only reason that it didn't work for them is because the scientific testing at the time could not prove that they were treases. They could, I mean, Eisenberg even testified that she wasn't even sure if they were human. Now, granted, they should have brought in another expert <laughs> to, to verify if they would. That might have helped. But so I think that it'd be really hard for the state to say now that they didn't realize that it had any potentially exculpatory value. Um, so, oh, the pelvic bone is still with, with law enforcement? They didn't get rid of that one? Okay. Somebody's telling me that they didn't get rid of the pelvic bone. I thought that was part of those tag numbers. <laughs> So, okay, well, then that'd be, that'd be the reason she didn't bring it up then. That would make sense. Because I think that that would have been one, those would have been ones that, I mean, honestly, I wish they would have, because I think that there would have been a really good case for that. Somebody's typing. Um, are they going to try to say he killed her on his property, then tried to remove the bones and put them on the quarry so it wouldn't be blamed on him, but didn't get all the bones? Again, they can try, but not they not now, because they never said that. Their their narrative um, is that Steve never left the property, so they can't change that now. They can't all of a sudden say, "Well, he might have gone over to the court." No, you don't get to do that. You know, you you have to stick with what the jury heard. Um. Well, actually, that's not true, Brandy. That's what I've said many times. I said the statute doesn't say that. The statute says that biological material that um is known to be the victims can't be disposed of. It doesn't say everything biological can't be disposed of. That's why I think Kathleen is trying to focus on the fact that the timing of it, when, the, when they disposed of it, because at that point, they really shouldn't have been getting rid of anything because it was still in the middle of appeal. And Kathleen focuses this herself because the important part of the statute is the second part. That's what she needs to win on. She did say that, <laughs> where did she say that? Um, after she mentioned the... Uh, let me see. Yeah, after she mentioned the statute, she said that, um, therefore, the suspected human bones recovered from the Manitowoc route are properly considered within the ambit of 968-205. And that's a stretch. She knows as well as I do that, that, that black and white does not say that. It does not say suspected. It says that they have to belong to the victim. But there are two parts of the statute. And what she, I mean, she does that in one paragraph. She mentions about how they're suspected bones, and that means they should have been preserved. The rest of the motion is focusing on the second part of the statute. So, like I said, even she knows that black and white letter of the law, they didn't violate it by getting rid of that when they weren't um, known to be traces of bones. But where they, they violated it was the second part of the statute, which I've read so many times already, I should know it by heart. But um, Let's see. It said, if the biological material may be reasonably used to incriminate or exculpate any person for the offense, the law enforcement agency shall preserve the physical evidence until every person in custody as a result of the conviction has reached his or her discharge date. So that is the, the important part of the statute. That's what she's focusing on. And this is why she made all these arguments, because as I mentioned in another, my last video or two videos ago, whatever it was, that that is a subjective standard. That is something that, you know, the state can just try to say like, well, we didn't believe that it had any potentially exculpatory value, therefore we got rid of it. So that's why these are all the arguments she's making is to fight this second part of the statute. Like I said, she spent one paragraph on the first part that said, well, they're suspected to be her and that's good enough. No, that's not, and she knows it. That's why she did not spend a lot of time on that part of it. She's focusing on the second part of the statute. <sighs> Okay. Uh, yeah, again, you guys, oh my God, you guys are asking so many, oh, so much stuff. Okay. I'll get to it eventually. Okay. So this is where she really gets into um, the statute and the case law. Now, again, as I said in my previous video, I had told you guys that because people had asked, well, what happens if they violated the statute? And I was like, there's literally no case that provides any kind of remedy. The statute doesn't say it, and there's no case law in a criminal case. There was in a civil case. And in the civil case, they had said that um, overturning a conviction was too severe of a penalty um, unless there was egregious misconduct. Okay, so 
Um, and this is prior to this statute being enacted. Okay, so that's why we're, she's saying that she's citing case law, but these, this case law was after that, or I mean before that. So there's no case law that is square with 968025 to say what the remedy would be if you violate the statute spe specifically. Um, okay, so this is why she's saying, so this is where she's saying that the conviction should be overturned and is the proper remedy because it violates the due process clause of the Constitution of the 14th Amendment, which basically says that, you know, a trial should be fundamentally fair and um, they're reasoning that, and they're reasoning that this is not um, because of the fact that evidence was not properly, well, you know everything in the case that's not proper. I wanted to get to one thing that I had written down separately. Um, yeah, she mentions, mentioned State versus Parker. And they say a defendant's due process rights are violated by the destruction of evidence if the evidence destroyed was apparently exculpatory, and that comes from Trombetto, and of such a nature that the defendant would be unable to obtain comparable evidence by other reasonable means, or number two, if the evidence was potentially exculpatory and was destroyed in bad faith, that comes from Youngblood. Um, and then it says that there is a long line of cases addressing the pretrial destruction of evidence and a defendant's due process rights. We see no reason why this line of cases should not apply to a post-conviction challenge to the post-conviction destruction of evidence. And they're actually citing State versus Noble in that. So again, there is, there is precedence for them saying that the same rule should apply whether it's pre-trial, during trial, or post-conviction. It shouldn't matter. The preservation of evidence rules should still be the same. Now, okay, so we're gonna move to just to California versus uh, Trombetto. And I'm just gonna go a little bit into this. Okay, oops. This case, and a lot of these cases actually, a lot of cases dealing with these issues are drunk driving cases. <laughs> um, people trying to uh, say that they weren't drunk because they weren't able to test, um, like a breathalyzer basically. They weren't able to um, duplicate that, those results. And in, in Trombetto, they're actually saying that, uh, well, I'll just read what, the, what, the, what they said about the case. This is the, uh, the US Supreme Court. It said, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment requires the state to disclose to criminal defendants favorable evidence that is material either to guilt or to punishment. Okay, we all know where that comes from, <laughs> Brady. Um, this case raises the question whether the 14th Amendment also demands that the state preserve potentially exculpatory evidence on behalf of defendants. In particular, the question presented is whether the due process clause requires law enforcement agencies to preserve breath samples of suspected drunken drivers in order for the results of breath analysis tests to be admissible. Okay, so that is the specific fact to that case. Okay, but the important part is when they say, um, it raises the question whether the 14th Amendment also demands that the state preserve potentially exculpatory evidence on behalf of defendants. So it's kind of like it's saying, in, in, like Brady established what the, the prosecution has to turn over to the defense, but now they're looking at the question of what needs to be preserved for later possible testing. Um, Okay, so then they also said in Trombetto, they said whatever duty the Constitution imposes on the states to preserve evidence, that duty must be limited to evidence that might be expected to play a significant role in the suspect's defense. To meet the standard of constitutional materiality, evidence must both possess an exculpatory value that was apparent before the evidence was destroyed and be of such a nature that the defendant would be unable to obtain comparable evidence by other reasonably available means. And then, and then they went on to say, neither of these conditions is met on the facts of this case. So that was the first part of what Kathleen presented. The, the first, you know, the first prong that she was talking about that was established in Greenwald comes from Trombetto and it was right there. It says it has to be mater material as far as being apparently exculpatory. Uh, and again, it's so hard. It's a judgment call. You know, like the, the state can say, well, it wasn't apparent that it was exculpatory. Well, that's a really hard argument to make because the, state, the defense was really wanting more testing done on those bones. And they wanted 
um, you know, they, they wanted to explore that more. Now, again, it's a little problematic that they didn't hire their own experts to do so because that's when you know, the argument for did they have other reasonable means of getting this information? Well, yeah, they could have hired somebody themselves to test it. So that's potentially problematic. Um, in this case with the breathalyzer, they said that, well, they had the option to do blood samples, urine samples, whatever. So, and they actually were given all of the results from the breathalyzer. Um, so they said that they had other reasonable means of getting the information they wanted, the scientific testing that could have been tested by them to prove whether they were or were not drunk. So that's why the court mainly ruled that, you know, they, they were, that it didn't fly, that his constitutional rights were not violated. Okay, so Arizona versus Youngblood then, um, which took place four years later, um, the U.S. Supreme Court expanded on it a little bit more, where now they said they, they brought in the issue of bad faith. So again, this is, I mean, it's all so self-explanatory in the brief. I feel bad even like explaining it because it's really easy to understand, I think. Um, but what they're saying in Youngblood is that if it is not apparent, apparently exculpatory, if it's potentially exculpatory, which I would believe that these bones do fall under, okay, and this is why Kathleen spent a lot of time on this argument. If it's potentially exculpatory, then they have to show that the evidence was destroyed in bad faith, okay? And then they go on in, uh, was it in Greenwald that specifically? No, I think it was another case um, where they talked about the difference between negligence and, and bad faith. And unfortunately, again, it's, it's like we know we can see it because we're on a certain side, but it's really hard to look at it, you know, objectively and then look, was this done in bad faith? Now, this is why Kathleen, I think she was making the argument, again, I skimmed it, saying that the fact that they destroyed it while the appeal was still pending in and of itself shows bad faith. You know, they shouldn't have had any right to destroy this evidence or, you know, get rid of it, um, dispose of it when an appeal was still pending. Um, the fact that it's DNA, it's biological material that could later DNA testing could, could prove to be exculpatory. Um, she's trying to make it seem that not, she's trying to make it seem kind of in, in the beginning that not only is it potentially exculpatory, but it's apparently exculpatory because anybody knows that based on what the case all said or what they said during trial, that if new DNA testing could prove those were Teresa's bones, well, then that's really, really important to the case. It's very central to the case. <laughs> Hi, Wendy. Okay, Eric, I'll just uh, see. I'm so conf I'm confused here. So a third party supplies on there with the report because he or she stumbled on it during her review of the case. Being it was a written report that was just not looked into or seen, it was still there, right? If it was there, doesn't this mean she's going to be procedurally barred from filing this issue? No, um, it shouldn't be. Well, I mean, I mean, technically they could say that because they could say that she should have requested the mo like the the um, case of report directly from the sheriff's office, but I mean, it's reasonable for her to conclude that the previous attorneys had all of the material. There's no reason for her to think that when she was given the case of report that, um, that it wasn't complete, especially since the date of when the bones were given away was well after the trial and well even after the appeal and everything else. So I don't think she really had any reason to think that there was more to it at that point. They weren't investigating anything, so why would it be in the investigative report? So, I mean, yeah, so they could try to say that she, you know, that, that um, she didn't use due diligence, but it wouldn't matter much because, again, this is still on this current petition. So if nothing else is barred from the pro se petition, well, then this wouldn't be either. So they can try to say that, but I just, I think it's kind of a weak argument. Hi, Sandy. Hey, Sandy, I was asking before, how do you say um, Suzanne's last name? Is it Hagopian? I mean, you're not going to be able to help me. I can't hear you if you tell me what it is, but just give me a yes or no. Am I saying that right or no, or, or not? Let's see if she's actually paying attention. <laughs> so, um, okay. 
so then, okay, so then it comes to, like I said, uh, where am I at now? I lost my place as usual. Some of the stuff is just repetitive, so I'm just going through it to see, um, make sure I'm just not repeating myself too much. Um, when discussing the holding in Trombetta, when they were deciding Arizona, a jury of Youngblood, or Youngblood versus Arizona, um, the, the Supreme Court said part of it stems for our unwillingness to read the fundamental fairness requirement of the due process clause. Um, let's see. Let's see, as imposing on the police an un undifferentiated and absolute duty to retain and to preserve all material that might be of conceivable evidentiary signif significance in a particular prosecution. We think that requiring a defendant to show bad faith on the part of the police both limits the extent of the police's obligation to preserve evidence to reasonable bounds and confines it to that class of cases where the interests of justice most clearly require it. Um, See, those cases in which the police themselves, by their conduct, indicate that the evidence could form a basis for exonerating the defendant. We therefore hold that the, unless a criminal defendant can show bad faith on the part of the police, failure to preserve potentially useful evidence does not constitute a denial of due process of law. So again, it's all just about this bad faith. Um, and uh, animus, they say, somewhere in there. <laughs> Um, now, in, in, in Youngblood versus Arizona, it was actually a child molestation case. So it was one of the few that it was not a drunk, drunk driving case. Um, and in that case, again, Wisconsin. <laughs> Gotta love them. Um, in this case, at the scene in the crime, they took no photographs at the crime scene. They impounded the vehicle, but they did no, like, testing on it, even though there was clearly biological material present. They mentioned you know, hair and blood stains. Um, they, they housed it in an unclosed location where, you know, nature, <laughs> you know, could, you know, had access to it. Um, and they still did not process it. <laughs> Sandy said that was close enough. Okay, so we'll go with it. Um, so they, they didn't even process it or even take any swabs or anything until nine days after the crime happened. So in that case, the trial court actually dismissed the case against him because they said that it was a violation of his due process, that this was not properly handled and that this material was not properly processed. And because of the way they handled it, he could not have a fair chance to now do any testing or anything because they screwed up the crime scene. Sounds a little familiar, you know. And this was in, uh, so young little, what did I say it was, 88? Yeah, things didn't change much after that, apparently. Um, and what happened, let's see. Oh, I was, I was talking about two different cases. Holy crap. That's, yeah. I was seeing that here. So that wasn't Trump. That was in Greenwald. Sorry. Oh my gosh. I totally mixed my cases up. Yeah. In Arizona, I just got done saying it was a child molestation case and I lost my train of thought. In that case though, um, and luckily this one was not in Wisconsin, <laughs> obviously Arizona. Um, in that situation, I said it was a child molestation case, and when they took all the biological samples, there was a urine sample that a tech was looking at under a microscope, and she thought she saw a sperm, an active sperm cell in the urine. Um, the guy who was um, charged with crime had an issue and could produce no sperm. So for him, those results were very important. Well, there was nothing that really specified what to do with these samples when you're done with them. And it apparently didn't occur to this person that works in the crime lab to just, you know, at least at the very least stick it in a refrigerator. Um, so when she was done looking at the slide, she didn't know what to do with it. So she threw it away. <laughs> she just threw it away. She's like, I don't want to do with it. So I looked at it. I think I saw something and I'm just going to throw it away. And that's what she did. And um, the reason that, uh, um, Youngblood did not win, though, is because they said that she didn't do it maliciously, you know, that it was not in bad faith. She was just negligent, which sometimes is a little outrageous because negligence is still just really incompetent work, you know. So, but yeah, the other, the other evidence in the case wasn't properly refrigerated either, and it's just a big old mess. And yet they said that uh, he could still be tried for it. And convicted of it, even though he couldn't test. It was basically one of, like I said before, one of those SOL situations. You know, you're just out of luck, dude. Sorry, because they said there was no bad faith, 
and it's like if somebody negligently discards evidence or maliciously i mean you're still depriving the person of an opportunity to help themselves so i really it's sometimes like a, it's dumb to think that it matters it shouldn't matter you know so Okay, so State versus Greenwald was the case where they had the, the, the vehicular, um, it was uh, homicide by intoxicated use of a motor vehicle. And that's where I said that they mishandled it in Wisconsin and everything. So anyway, so Greenwald, what Greenwald did was that, and this was 1994, this is the State Court of Appeals. What they did is they combined Trombetto and combined it with Arizona versus Youngblood. They just combined the two. And that's how they came up with the two prongs that we've already discussed a couple times. You know, so Trombetto came up with the whole materiality thing about whether it was apparently exculpatory. And then Youngblood then said, well, if it's potentially exculpatory, then you have to prove that there's bad faith. Um, now, in this case, Greenwald did not help himself because he testified on remand. They did, re you know, they actually did order an evidentiary hearing on this case. And Green, Greenwald testified that the officers did not intentionally obstruct or tamper with any evidence. Well, there you go. There's your, there's your argument for um, bad faith, against bad faith right there. And that's basically why they didn't, they didn't, he didn't win the case. So they said, you said yourself that you didn't think they did it maliciously. You know, it was just ne negligent. Um, yeah, and then that's why they said that he didn't, he didn't meet his um, burden of proving that the officers acted in bad um, bad faith. So even though they completely screwed up the crime scene and they didn't handle anything properly, again, it was just like I said, he was out of luck. Uh, yeah, this is so repetitive, so I don't want to keep saying the same things over and over. Um, unless they can show bad faith. Yeah, failure to preserve, preserve potentially useful evidence does not constitute a denial of due process, unless you can show that bad faith. Um, and then what they're saying is that though, if it's apparently exculpatory, that kind of rises above the potentially. Apparently, I guess, is higher than potentially. So that would make it a more egregious error, and that's why you don't have to show bad faith if it was apparently exculpatory. Um, Yeah, I don't really have. Okay, this is the one, let's see, just one thing, other thing. Yeah, they said in the Youngblood, in the Youngblood place, they, case, they didn't really clearly establish what bad faith is. They kind of just said what it's not. Um, so they basically explained what's negligent versus what's bad faith. Um, they said it is apparent from its analysis that there is no bad faith when the police neg negligently fail to preserve evidence, which is merely potentially exculpatory. So that really doesn't give you much to go on as far as like what constitutes bad faith. Um, so under Youngblood and the cases interpreting this its standard, the second prong requiring bad faith can bad faith can only be shown if the officers were aware of the potentially exculpatory value or usefulness of the evidence they failed to preserve. So they would have to be aware of it. And the officers acted with official animus or made a conscious effort to suppress exculpatory evidence. Now, this is again where it might be helpful when they say that they never let the um, defense know. They didn't give them anything from the investigative report telling them they did this. Um, they didn't even make any attempt to find out whether they should be contacting Steve or the defense to let them know they were planning on um, getting rid of it. So that in itself could constitute bad faith, just because like I said, the timing of it, um, the fact that they, they argued that they, these bones were significant during trial, um, and the fact that they weren't notified that the, these, this stuff was given to the hall box, and the fact that they didn't give them an opportunity to um, file any written response saying they didn't want it. Angie, I think I'm overqualified to work at a crime lab because I have a brain. Yeah, kind of seems like that at times. 
Yeah, okay, so this is one thing, Allie, I'm glad you brought it up because I know you brought this up during the other video. I remember when I did the last Stay in Remand and we were first talking about this statute, I, I believe it was you, Allie, that asked, like, well, isn't it the assumption then that they believe that it was the Hallbox alone since they gave them over to them? And I think I had said at the time that, well, you can't make any assumptions. You can't make any assumptions about what they were thinking. But Kathleen did put it in the brief and, or in the motion, and she should have because, again, um, she's trying to establish a factual basis that needs to be investigated. Um, it is not a fact that they believe they were Teresa Hellbox. It's a logical conclusion <laughs> because, as even you know, I said, I know everybody said, why would anybody want non-human bones or animal bones to substitute for their loved one? So it's logical to think that the state told them it was the whole box at least, you know, I mean, or at least thought themselves that it could be her bones. But again, just Kathleen saying it, it's a logical conclusion doesn't make it fact. But who are the triers of fact? The trial court, not the court of appeals. So even if they want to, so bringing that up, even if they just want to establish, was this the reasoning, they have to have a hearing. So that's why it's good that she brought that up. Because as I said, it's a logical conclusion because nobody can understand why any family would take bones that didn't belong to their loved ones, especially if they're animal bones or suspected non-human. Um, so yeah, and again, since that's a factual issue that needs to be debated, that has to happen in the trial court. And so that in itself could be enough to warrant a hearing. Sorry, Allie, that wasn't what you mentioned now, but you saying it just reminded me of that. Oh, and you just said this in another comment. Yeah, they knew that what they were doing, yeah. Will this also assist Brendan? Well, that's kind of interesting. In general, yes, <laughs> because if they didn't let them know either, um, then Brendan's case was even less far along in the appellate process. Um, Brendan's case didn't reach its state finality until 2013, almost two years after this was, that they gave these bones away. So Brendan's case in that respect um, is even worse violation, it seems like, because I mean, he was well, you know, still in the beginning of his, his post-conviction process when they did this. So um, the only thing that is bad for Brendan, and this is only if they try to retry him again, and so it won't matter now, but um, it is part of the narrative in his tr his case that he did say that they went to the, that bones were taken to the quarry. Brennan said that in his confession. So as far as any post other post or new post conviction petition he raises, um, that is an issue that can be argued um, with the state's narrative in his trial, not in Steve's trial, but in his trial because he mentioned taking bones to the quarry. I mean, he also mentioned digging a hole and burying bones next to the burn pit, and we know that didn't happen. So, you know, so I don't know how far that will get them, but, um, but still, I mean, yeah, I mean, if it's ruled that these bones shouldn't have been given away, it applies to Brendan just as much as it does to Steve. Yeah, and it makes only sense. And that's why I said it's a logical conclusion to make that, you know, if they gave the bones away, they knew they were the hall box or they at least told the hall box they were her bones because why would they want them otherwise? So it's a logical conclusion. It's just not a fact. <laughs> you need to find out what is factually correct. And you have to do that in the trial court, which would then automatically require a hearing. So that you can get them on the stand and say, why did you do this? What was your reasoning? Well, you know, and then it will be for the judge to decide whether their reasoning holds any water or not, whether it's, you know, a good argument or not. Um, that's really about it. I mean, I, again, I meant to go through this more and look at it more carefully, but I seriously, like I skimmed everything. So that's why I was kind of like, eh. And as I was skimming everything, I was like, this, this uh, motion is pretty self-explanatory. I don't think there's a whole lot of questions, but I'm gonna scroll back now and just see what the questions were, because I don't think I really have anything specific to say. Why is it not letting me scroll back all the way? You guys talk too much, I guess. <laughs> um, do I think they're really gonna let him out? Well, it's not a matter of letting him out. You know, I mean, it's a matter of like, whether they can, you know, um, legally, um, present enough to get him out. Um, there's some standards that they just can't get past, you know, um, and if people act like, you know, like they've never overturned, you know, gosh, there's serial killers that have had convictions overturned before. So it's not like it's a case of, 
we just don't want Stephen Avery out and nobody else. I mean, yeah, there's the concern for a, a lawsuit, but I mean, the courts do overturn murder convictions a lot. <laughs> Not a lot, but you know what I mean, you know, comparatively. Um, okay. Yeah, and Jennifer's saying the main point, the case was still under appeal, so any evidence should stay with law enforcement. Agreed, and that's what she's arguing. She's just saying, like, at that point, when the appeal was still pending, there was no legal finality, how can they say that there was basically no use of keeping that anymore? It's ridiculous, especially when it comes to biological material. Uh, why would the state not have acknowledged that the bones were no longer in their possession? Um, <laughs> because they were on, I probably wanted to hide that fact. Um, again, it's very suspicious that they never gave them the latest on the uh, post-conviction process. But you know, they never gave Kathleen anything on the, um, the new case I'll report either. And, but yet I know there's things that they have given her on their own. So it's really strange how they handle things sometimes. And, and just like I've always said with, as far as like FOIA requests go, it's hard to request something when you don't even know it exists. How do you know what to ask for when you don't know it's a thing? You know, well, it's the same thing with Kathleen. It's like, how can she request something when she has no reason to think that it's incomplete or there's more to it? If that was the investigative report that was handed over to Steve's, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, if, if that was, you know, the investigative report that was hand, like handled the case and we are now at the end of the appellate stage, there is no reason for her to think that there was more to, to that report. Why would there be? What else would they be investigating? And if they were actively investigating, even though I know saying um, that the bones were turned over to the Hallbox, but if they were actively investigating anything, it should have been made known to the appellate court. Or to the, the court attorney, sorry. Um, let's see, why would they have even? So could this turn into case law? Yes, uh, actually it could be presidential because even though, um, Greenwald is the is the controlling case on this. There is no, no controlling case since this preservation statute. Kathleen also said that the DNA statute itself, the 97407, is also kind of an indicator that the intention is to preserve all biological evidence. Because why would they say that you're allowed to test it at any time if they can just destroy it whenever they want to. So she's using that argument too, saying like, well, you people created this other statute for DNA testing. Why would you do that if it's okay for law enforcement to just get rid of whatever they want whenever they want to? Yeah, some people are just kind of repeating some of the things I said already. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Dana. She's saying that um, there's a carpet place in Michigan that's called Hagopian, and that's how you pronounce it. So hopefully we're right. Um, well, this is not specific to having a fair trial, but I mean, your appeal is supposed to be fair too. I mean, and so again, they have that DNA statute so that you can have a post, you know, do post-conviction testing. I mean, that's the whole reason they have the statute to allow for it. So um, that's why I said this isn't necessarily with regards to um, the fundamental fairness of a trial, but it does have to do with the fundamental fairness of a post-conviction process. Uh, <laughs> just blinded you, sorry, Eric. <laughs> uh, is there any one reason they would not hear this finding in your opinion? Um, no, they should, because like I said, I, I, I actually understood and I kind of thought that was what the opinion was gonna be on the last day in remand. I wasn't sure, you know, um, but this one, there's no reason they shouldn't remand it because you are dealing specifically now with, they're not asking to do the testing. They're not asking for a separate procedure to be done. She's saying this is a constitutional violation of his due process. And it needs to be addressed now because it would be something that should normally go in a petition like this. Um, and that the only reason it didn't is because they didn't know about it. 
so once a baby became aware of it, they should be allowed to add this to the petition, just like they did with the CD. Um, the only thing in this situation is that it almost demands a hearing because, again, how can you how can you even make an, a decision on the second part of the statute about whether they, you know, they were it was reasonable for them to dispose of this evidence if you don't actually put anybody on the stand and have questioning going back and forth. Uh, Yeah, and if they said they notified Steve that they, they would have to have proof of it. There would have to be a letter because that's how they would have had to notify him. They would have had to notify him in writing. So, um, yeah, yeah, there would also be evidence of it. Uh, and who knows, like if, if once, I don't know, she might might be allowed to test things once it goes back to the court circuit court. I don't know. She might. But that's not an issue right now. So she's saying, well, you know, can you imagine the state responding with, well, we know they were animal bones, but we decided to lie to the hall box and tell them that they were animal, that the animal bones were really their daughters. Yeah, actually, I can see them doing that. That's why I wonder, like, and that's what they're going to have to answer to. Like, did you lie to this family? Like, why did they accept animal bones in place of their daughter's remains? Allie said, what about the bones they gave the hallbacks that came from the burn pit and burn barrel number two? These are definitely bones that were used to convict in their narrative. I have to, I, I'm going to fully admit, I never um, investigated the tag numbers and which specific bones. I just didn't. It's just too tedious for me. Um, so I didn't, so I don't really know specifically which bones were used in the trial. I thought it was just the pelvic bones that were. Um, so yeah, if they gave away any bones that were in the burn pit or the burn barrel, well, yeah, then that obviously would be important, but I would think that Kathleen would mention that in the motion because, again, anything that was used in the trial definitely should not have been gotten rid of before any um, appellate proceeding was concluded and honestly shouldn't be gotten rid of at all because he can challenge evidence in the trial anytime. I can see them making an argument if something was never brought up during the trial or any post conviction process or an appeal. I can see them making that argument of why they didn't think it was important at that point. Joseph said, I, I, um, I have not read the entire brief, but correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like even though Wisconsin law states clearly they weren't allowed to do what they did, but the law doesn't state what the consequences are if those laws are violated. Well, again, it's not clear that they violated. In, in a logical sense, in the way Kathleen's presenting it, it sounds like, yeah, they violated it, but it's not clear. If they had been identified as Teresa's bones, then it would absolutely be clear cut that they violated it. Again, this is something that has to be hashed out in court where it said if it was objectively reasonable for them to dispose of them or for them to not think that they had any value, they are permitted to get rid of it. Um, so that is the part that would need to be hashed out in court. And that's why, again, I said it's so important, the timing of it, because it's really hard to make that argument when it's still under appeal. But the second part of that question, yes, it, the, the law does not state any remedy, any consequences. And yeah, I said that when we first talked about it, I said that it's just I know somebody then asked, well, what is the co are the consequences if they violate it? And I was just like, I don't know, because they've never addressed it before. Um, the state will have a chance to respond. Yes, that they, they want, they, they will have a chance to respond. <laughs> I say it's, it's strange. Um, what do I foresee as the state's response? Exactly what I just said. They'll say that, you know, any bones that were given back to them um, were not used during the trial, if that's the case. Now, Allie just said some were used during the trial, so that wouldn't be a very good argument. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't really think they have a great argument against this either way. But again, they could say that they, they, basically the only argument they can make is that they did not personally believe that they had any ex exculpatory value at that point since they were never brought up previously. Why did they do it? They never anticipated ma'am, KZ, or millions of eyes dissecting it. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of this stuff, you know, they did it because they could get away with it. And that changed when everybody started looking at the case. Uh, will new attorney general make a difference? I don't think so. I personally don't. I mean, Josh Call's mother is Peg Lautenschlager. I mean, just that alone 
makes it hard for me to believe that he is ever going to have any interest in getting to the bottom of this because his mother is most likely at the center of a lot of it, of the corruption. So I just don't see, I think there's even a worse chance than there was with Schimmel personally, but you know. Um, did Stevens' old lawyers were formed? I don't even understand the question. Sorry, Kate, I don't understand the question exactly. Um, Tracy said, would the Calumet reports Casey got with the case file be in the same form as numbered like we had? Could the state argue the defense knew these reports were missing pages? Um, only if they looked at the ones that are online. But again, why would she? She would think that she already had it. You know, that's one of those things that, yeah, I mean, I guess easily the law clerk could have looked and said, hey, why is the one that everyone then the public is reading have more pages than ours? Um, but yeah, it should go by the same order. I mean, that's that's how the file is in their but the, the report is in their file. Yeah, I mean, exhumation is, I mean, if they buried the bones, yeah, exhumation is possible. You know, obviously you're dealing kind of with a chain of custody issue, but it wouldn't be the first case where a body was exhumed in order to do further um, testing. I'm just going to go through the rest. Yeah, they're asking Carol how she figured this out. Like I, I said, I remember when I first read the case of report, I remember something about returning bones, but I didn't, I didn't, I certainly wouldn't know the tag numbers or anything. And for me, it just didn't occur to me that Kathleen wouldn't know it. That's all. You know, I mean, it was there for everyone to see. It's just some people didn't read that far. <laughs> it's, it's at the very end of the report. And I know a lot of people just didn't get that far. And I think even I was basically skimming at that point. So, um, yeah, so it was one of those things. I had this vague recollection of bones being returned, but I didn't really couldn't remember the details. And again, it would never occur to me to send it to Kathleen. So I'm glad that, that Carolyn did that. Okay, Allie's saying that she did investigate and they definitely did give one from the burn pit and two teeth fragments from the burn pit. Why the heck would they just give her teeth, tooth fragments? God, okay, sorry. And also the pelvic bone was given to him. That's what I thought, but okay. So yeah, I'm surprised that then, if that's the case, I'm surprised that Kathleen didn't specifically mention those bones because those were important to the trial. Is there a way that she can now go and ask to verify she's not missing some other documents? Oh yeah, well she re she requested the full file now or the full um, investigative report, and I'm sure that FOIA request also included anything else that she might not possibly have. How long does the state have to respond? Um, there's no really set time frame usually within a week i mean if you want to make sure that the court actually gives you time to respond you want to do it relatively quickly like within a few days but i would say by next week they should respond okay so any other last questions i i, I couldn't see any questions from the very beginning because there are too many comments but i want to wrap this up because it's already been it's been close to an hour already and i feel like i didn't even tell you guys anything good or interesting or something you kind of figured out yourself but i don't want to be on too much longer so um do you guys have any other last minute last questions otherwise obviously you know i'll go back and look oh i just answered that crystal um i said that they want to answer as soon as possible um but there's no specific time, but I would say by next week. Would she not need to get into specific bones or tag numbers? Yeah, then that was 11 days. That seems long. I don't, I don't know. Okay, Travis has 11 days to respond. So um, it's it's. I'm sure it's in the statutes of the motion somewhere, and I just haven't looked it up in a while. I'm sure I knew it one time. Um, I for, I have forgotten more about this case than I than I re, you know actually remember to begin with. It's crazy. You guys are welcome.
Okay, so, all right, well then I will talk to you guys soon, and if not before then, I'm sure you'll be hearing from me when the state files a response, so hopefully it'll be next week, but it could be longer. But again, I said, I, I think I do remember that, and all Travis said that 11 days, I think I do remember that in a previous motion that I looked it up, so that's, that is probably true. I just, again, mental moment, or just me being forgetful. So, okay. Um... Okay, that's it. I'm going to wrap it up. So you guys have a good night. Bye.